just a few years after succeeding his father, Genghis, as Great Khan of the Mongol Empire. Ogadai Khan ordered his nephew, Prince Batu, to invade Europe. Now, Ogadai had already consolidated his power over Persia. He'd made Korea a, a Mongol vassal. He'd taken down the Jin or Jurchen polity in North China, and he was then battling the Song, the Southern Song, down there in Southern China. But he set his eyes west. His goal was to conquer and create a Mongol dominion reaching all the way to the Great Sea. Great Sea being the Atlantic Ocean. I'll let that sink in for a second. Now, the general he chose to lead the charge under Batu's authority was the veteran Subutai, possibly the greatest general in world history, certainly one of the most brutal. And they were to take down the pesky Bulgars, take down the Kipchak, and conquer all the way to the Great Sea. And their initial target was to be Rus, the Rus. Now, according to one observer at the Mongol court, the Mongols were prepared to fight a 30 years war in Europe to make this happen. Now, under Subutai's command, virtually all of Russia was conquered by the Mongols. And they left a trail of devastation, broken cities, broken armies, broken principalities in their wake. And the only major part of Russia that was really spared was Novgorod, and that because Novgorod submitted willfully, offered to become a tribute-paying vassal of the Mongols. Now the beating heart of Kievan Rus, of old Rus, which of course the city of Kiev itself, was laid waste in 1240. Now this 350 year old federation that we call Kievan Rus, which is already in decline by the way, never recovered from these events. Next up, Subutai had a plan that involved multiple Mongol armies and the conquest of Central Europe. Now the first of those armies was sent into Poland. The Kingdom of Poland had been divided about a century earlier. And when the Mongols showed up, it was still divided, which more or less negated any chance of a, you know, a quick unified defense. So the Mongols sacked Lublin, the Mongols sacked Sandomierz, and then they divided into two forces, one force heading into Central Poland, the other force heading into Southern Poland. Both areas were devastated. Wrocław was ravaged. Kraków was ravaged. Multiple Polish armies were taken down, some completely annihilated. At the Great Battle of Legnica, a coalition army made up of Poles and Moravians and others was completely routed by the Mongol force. Thus, the Mongols in Poland, this first army, had done its job. What was its job? What was the point of sending that Mongol force into Poland? it turns out that that Mongol force sent into Poland was relatively small. The larger Mongol army had been sent here into the Kingdom of Hungary. See, that Polish army, the, the Mongol army sent into Poland, was supposed to knock out that northern flank to protect the bigger army sent here into Hungary. And the Mongols devastated Hungary. In one day, one day, the entire Hungarian army was annihilated by the Mongols at a place called Muhi. The Hungarian king and a handful, a small handful of others, escaped alive. By Christmas Day, the Mongols had conquered Pest on the banks of the Danube. Today, Budapest is one city. You've got Pest on one side of the Danube, Buda on the other side of the Danube. I'm on an island in the middle of the Danube, in the middle of Budapest. It's called Margaret Island. By Christmas, the Mongols had conquered Pest behind me. And within a couple months, they had to wait for the Danube to freeze over. And then they crossed over and conquered Buda on the hilly side, on the other side of the Danube. The Mongols had conquered Hungary. And in the process, somewhere between 25% and 50% of the entire Hungarian population died. Uh, the chroniclers of the time wrote about this as a complete destruction of Hungary. And in many ways, they were right. Now, there's a little irony in this given that 300 years earlier, it was the Magyars who had barreled their way into Central and even into Western Europe, ravaging the entire time before they finally settled down on the Hungarian plain. And now their descendants are the victims of another steppe people. The Mongols had conquered Russia. They'd ravaged Poland. They'd taken down Hungary. They were the lords of the Danube. There was a Mongol force, you know, knocking on the doors of Vienna at that very moment. Uh, Mongols had reached 
the Adriatic Sea, the Dalmatian coast, actually pursuing the fleeing Hungarian king. I mean, they were poised to take over all of Europe, to actually reach the Great Sea in the West. So why didn't they? Why did they stop at that point? Subutai himself had plans to take down the Holy Roman Empire. Why didn't he do it? Now, some scholars point to the European climate, even climate change, to explain the Mongol turnaround, the sudden turnaround. You know, it was snowy, it was cold, but that didn't seem to stop the Mongols. I mean, under Subutai, the Mongols covered 60 miles a day on horseback on the Hungarian plain where there were several feet of snow. So it doesn't seem to be a great explanation, though recent studies have shown that it was about this time that a considerably cold and wet period set in, which would have resulted in shrinking pasture lands and sort of marshy conditions. You can see how that would negatively affect the Mongols' army on horseback. Another theory, probably the strongest, is that the Mongols left because of events that had nothing to do with Europe at all, but political events way back in Karakorum. Ogadai, the great Khan, had died. See, he was probably an alcoholic. Anyway, he died, so you've got Mongol princes from all over rushing back to Karakorum to elect a successor. Of course, each one of these has his own political ambitions as well, and Batu certainly was one of those. So in March, just one month after taking Buddha across the river there, Batu's marching back to Karakorum to be part of, you know, these political events. Subutai, by the way, was very much against this. He was ready to keep going. But of course, he wasn't of the blood. He wasn't a Mongol prince. He was just a general. So he was overruled. On their way out of Europe, the Mongols beat up on the Byzantines and ravaged Bulgaria. So the death of Ogadai was followed by years of political jockeying and regency and the threat of civil war within the Mongol Empire itself thus preventing any quick continuation of, you know, a Mongol invasion of Europe. It didn't help that Batu Khan and his Golden Horde set themselves up in Russia as one part of a fragmenting Mongol Empire, thus, you know, squashing any designs Karakoram might have had of a united Mongol invasion of Europe and conquest all the way to the Great Sea. So Ogadai's death in more ways than one set in motion a chain of events that may have saved Christendom. Another theory? Geography. It was all geography. And the Mongols had had a relatively easy time conquering those parts of Europe that rather naturally and flatly ran into the Asian steppes. But they weren't prepared for the thick European forests, European hills, European mountains. And there may be something to this theory. But keep in mind that the Mongols carried with them tree-cutting specialists, and they were very good at blazing paths through forests. So I'm not sure that the European forests would have stopped them. That said, the Mongols did seem hampered by mountainous terrain. Their campaign in Croatia, for example, the mountains did slow them down and, in addition, make them easier targets for ambush. So again, there may be something to this geography theory. But at the end of the day, it might just have been European defenses that convinced the Mongols to stop while they were ahead in Europe, or that at least prevented a general Mongol takeover of all of Europe and, you know, conquest all the way to the Great Sea. The after ravaging central and southern Poland, a small Mongol force had continued on into Bohemia, but the Czechs stood strong and the Mongols had given up on that front. After ravaging Hungary, of course, that part of Hungary that was mostly just a plain they had a harder time against the fortresses of Hungary. So when they left, Hungary uh, fortified not just its towns and cities along its border, but throughout the country. Croatia did the same thing. Croatia had had a similar experience. The Mongols, in you know, chasing that Hungarian king through Croatia, had easily sacked Zagreb, which was not fortified, but had been defeated at the fortress of Klis. And so when the Mongols were gone, the Croatians fortified their country. In any case, the Mongol Empire wasn't united again for many years after that initial invasion of Europe, and even then, it was united only temporarily before permanently fracturing. The most important parts of that fracture for Europe being the Ilkhans of Southwest Asia and, of course, the Golden Horde in Russia and Ukraine. Still, the Mongols weren't done, not by a long shot, with Europe, 
after that first lightning-like advance. A lightning-like advance that could have been attached to much more territorial gain, possibly all the way to the Great Sea, to Ogodai's Great Sea, had it not been suddenly stopped, with most of Europe still intact. And though later invasions devastated Eastern Europe and parts of Central Europe again, the threat of a continent-wide Mongol takeover had largely passed, thanks to wet weather, climate change, shamanistic injunctions, you know, mountains, forests, and hills, infighting among Mongol princes, the alcoholism of a Mongol Khan, and the fortresses of Hungary and Croatia.